13. We're about to wind down uh, with our study here in the book of Hosea. We're seeking God's will for the next uh, event, the next thing that God would have us to do. And we always want to be obedient to God and His, uh, uh, His guidance. And uh, as we continue to talk about the voice of the prophets, and this is according to Hosea, we are in chapter 13. And uh, we're going to uh, read the first four verses. So those of you that can and will, as you find your place, please stand in honor of reading of God's Word. And the Bible says here in chapter 13, verse number 1, When Ephraim spake, trembling, he exalted himself in Israel, but when he ascended uh, in Baal, he died. And now they sin more and more, and have made them molding images of their silver and idols, according to their own understanding. All of it, the work of the craftsmen, uh, they say to of them, Let the men that sacrifice kiss the cow. Therefore, they shall be as the morning cloud and as the early dew that passeth away, and the chaff that is divided with the whirlwind out of the floor, and as the smoke out of the chimney. Yea, I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know God but me. It says, no, no God but me. For there is no Savior besides me. Let us pray one more time, Father. I do now ask that you have your blessings on the reading of the word. I pray, God, that you have your blessings on this lesson. The Lord will be careful to give you praise and honor and glory for these things we do ask in thy name. Amen and amen. Thank you. you. May be seated tonight. If I was to give a title to this chapter, I would be entitled it "The Only Savior." The Only Savior, and uh, uh, outside of God, there is no other Savior. We just need to understand that. And in Him is our help. According to verse number nine, if you would flip all over there, the Bible says, "O Israel," it says, "Thou hast destroyed thyself, but in Thee is thine help." So there is only but one Savior and only one help, and that comes through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The quicker people realize that, the better they will be in this world we live in. I'm talking about Christians, and I'm talking about sinners all in all. Uh, the whole thought of this text here is for Israel to understand that there is only but one God, and he is their help. We see in the Scripture, in verse number 1, as we'll ca uh, catch it here in just a moment, Talking about Ephraim, uh, Ephraim dies. It's just like God says, I've had enough of it. I've had enough of the situation, and it's over. He'll put an end to it. And that will happen, and that can happen even in this day and time that we live in. We'll get on that in just a few more minutes. But anyway, uh, God and Jesus Christ, I believe that uh, both are the same as we understand the Scripture, is our only hope and is our only help that we have here in this world. Mark chapter 12 and verse number 32 says this, For there is one God, and there is none other but He. Now we understand that. We understand Scripture. We understand that He's true in that saying. Ephesians 4.4 4 says, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. Verse 5 says, One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Verse 6 says, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. What I like about that scripture is an understanding, confirming what is being said by the prophet. There is but one God. There's only one God. There's one salvation. There's one body. Everything, there's just one. You can't add nothing to that. You can't take anything away from it. But the blessing I like about that verse, when you look at it and read it, when he's talking about there's one God and Father of all who is above all and through all, and get this, and in you all. Wasn't that a blessing? God's confirming in his word that if we accept him as God, as we, if we accept him as Father, we accept him as uh, his Spirit and his Son, then he is in us. It's a guaranteed thing. He's there. You know, you can't take that away. I said you couldn't take nothing away from the Scripture. You can't take that away. I mean, that is a promise that he's given us of what a blessing it is. I said there's only one Savior. Now, we see in the Scripture, as I said, the death of Ephraim. Now, remember, Ephraim, Ephraim is 
not the name of the individual, but we also understand through our study that Ephraim is representing Israel. It is a place in which Israel had resided. Now, please understand that you can look at this tonight as the Ephraim movement, so to speak. Uh, uh, Ephraim uh, uh, was like a movement for Israel that got into the situation they got into in the rebellious stage. And I say tonight that many people are in an Ephraim movement in their own spiritual lives. They get away from God, they rebel against God, and they turn against God and won't turn to him. We've talked about that in our study. But now God said, okay, I've had enough of this movement. I've had enough of this thought pattern. I've had enough of this attitude. I've had enough of this way of living, and I'm going to stop to it. And he basically said, Ephraim dies. Now, we notice that Ephraim was proud and would not admit to his wrong. Uh, Ephraim uh, exalted himself to the point of boastfulness. The Bible knows what it said. Ephraim spake trembling. Now, if you know anything about Ephraim, do a little back study on Ephraim. Uh, Ephraim much, was not much one for uh, trembling much. I mean, he, he didn't act like a scaredy cat or anything like that. But what he did, you can kind of look at it this way. Because of the fear in his heart, he trembled with his speech. The same as most preachers do, a lot of preachers do. I'm probably one of the world's worst. You can pick up on it. Uh, you know, uh, it's whenever you get, you know, you get nervous, you get scared. Uh, you know, you have the fear in you. You're trying to do something for God Almighty. I mean, you're trying to represent Him up here, and we stumble sometimes. We uh, mess mess up sometimes in trying to quote things, say things. Sometimes it don't come out. That's kind of what Ephraim was like because he knew what was coming. And the reason why is because what the second part of the verse said, after he exalted himself, I mean, basically he's trying to boast himself up, saying, well, you know, uh, yeah, sure, I, I, I didn't do right, but, you know, I'm still, I'm still who I am. I'm still representing Israel. But the Bible says, but when he offended in Baal, basically when he started worshiping war, uh, uh, idols, when he started uh, putting idols before God, he died. God said, it's the end of that movement. No more. I'm not going to put up with it any anymore. Um, I look at this verse, and I look at Ephraim in this situation, just like I look at a lot of people in this day and time we live in, how that men will brag on their sin, and men brag sort of to hide their shame. Instead of owning up to the fact that someone's doing wrong or they're doing wrong, it's like they are, are uh, uh, kind of I don't know, making a joke of it, uh, kind of boasting about it, to try to cover up their shame. You ever heard anybody brag about doing wrong? Brag about sinning? And they're just trying to cover up their shame because they're trying to justify it in their own hearts that what they did really wasn't that bad and it's okay. Uh, I'll be honest with you folks, sinning is not a joke. It's not a laughing matter. Uh, people who do wrong, you just... I mean, you just don't laugh about that stuff. It's a serious thing. And I believe that we need to understand serving God is a serious thing. We don't need to joke around about it and cut up about it and laugh about it as though that it's okay. You know, we shouldn't do that. Pride goeth before destruction, according to Proverbs 16 and verse 18. Pride goeth before destruction. So we understand with Ephraim in his situation, uh, representing Israel here, that uh, basically their pride is going right before their destruction comes, okay? When Ephraim turned to worship from Baal, he died, okay? Not only did Ephraim die, but so did the land around him. At the last of this chapter, which I'm not going to cover verse 15 and verse 16 thus yet in the scripture tonight, I'm going to put them over with chapter 14 because they go with chapter 14. But just so you know, down in verse number 16, it talks about uh, Samaria shall become desolate. Just understand uh, that, uh, uh, that when Ephraim died because of his doing, so did other people, other cities, other groups, other things around him, and so did the land. Uh, uh, Samaria uh, and other cities of that area are some of the most desolate places that you're going to find. Now, I've never been over there, but you know what? With the power of internet, we're able to do about anything or go anywhere, and uh, I encourage you, if you like to mess around with that stuff, 
uh, get on Google Map, uh, expand out to the world, go over to that area and zoom back in, you're going to find nothing but an old desolate desert area. And a lot of these cities, a lot of these cities, uh, they're still uncovering ruins of these places. Man, they, they, just, they were destroyed. They were destroyed. They were taken, taken over and became desolate. Um, uh, like many religious movements outside of God and outside of this Bible, they don't stick around much, folks. They come, they go. They're here for a while, and then they're gone. It's like fads. Remember growing up with the fads that we used to have uh, as, as growing up as kids? I mean, you know, there was a fad uh, uh, that everybody had to have big hair. And then there was a fad everybody had to have long hair. And then there was a fad everybody had to have short hair. You know, I'm just using that as an illustration. It comes, it goes, you know. Uh, I'm, uh, just so you know, I've always been the same. <laughs> I never parted my hair down the middle, middle and tried to have them feather things that people did when I was in school. I mean, Y'all remember that time period. I mean, I never tried that. I thought, man, I just, I'm not going to do it. That just doesn't look right. And I did do it. I, every one of my friends did. And they always told me, they said, man, Drew, you got to get cool. You got to do this. And I'm like, man, that ain't my hairstyle. I'm not going to. I've always looked the way I have. I see people I went to school with, and they look and say, man, you haven't changed. I'm like, man, they're going blind, too, because I'm older pattern and everything else but uh, but anyway you know I'm just saying fads come fads go so does these religious movements that we deal with sometimes we look at things and we're like my goodness I mean how worse can it get uh, I remember a time here a while back remember the gothics I mean good gracious man they were, it was everywhere and now you don't hardly see it anymore it's a thing that's kind of faded out of course it's faded into something else and it keeps fading over into other things that's kind of way things like that work. So therefore, with being that said, just know that God has given us an illustration here uh, of, of uh, I guess you could say, examples of cult, of cult worship. Okay? Notice again in verse number two, it says, Now they sin more and more because Ephraim died. That movement's died, and they just went all out now. They're sinning more and more. Talk about Israel. Uh, they sin more and more. And have made them molten images, not like they hadn't already. They're just increasing them now. And it says, and idols according to their uh, 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 their own understanding. And all in, see, it's all of it, the work of the craftsmen, they say of them, let the men that sacrifice kiss the calves. Now they're kissing on these things. I mean, can you imagine? Can just think about some of the religious movements where they're kissing idols now and uh, you know kissing the feet and stuff like that uh, you know and, and some even gone as far as I, I don't know just a lot of different things going on okay uh, it, it basically it's cult worshiping and here's the three signs number one sacrifices folks we've done away God's done away with uh, sacrifices when he sacrificed Christ there was no more need of the shedding the blood of animals at that point because Christ was the ultimate sacrifice. There's need, no need of no more sacrifices, not even today. I pastored a church one time when I first went to the church. They informed me of the former pastor of the church. He's done dead and gone now. But uh, they, they informed me that uh, he, um, he was getting into modern Judaism and he was wanting to sacrifice a lamb in the fellowship building of the church. He had actually, they had just got the fellowship building completed and finished. Uh, beautiful, beautiful fellowship building. He actually locked the doors and kept the keys for himself. And he said, that's where we're having Jewish services. On Sunday mornings, they had Baptist services. Sunday afternoons, they had Jewish services. Now, of course, there's a lot of people that didn't go because of that, but he was bringing in other people. And when he decided he wanted to sacrifice a lamb, that's when some of the people in the church stood up and said, uh, no, did, we're not doing this. You're, we're not going there. You're not going to do this. And they literally ran him off the hill. Okay? And uh, uh, they say they had to break into their own fellowship building to clean all that mess out. And uh, so, um, but anyway, we don't have a need for sacrifice anymore. Christ was the final sacrifice. Praise God. He died for our sins. He covered our sins. It's over. Praise the Lord. But they are some that still do the sacrifices. 
in, in this world. And we can go into another area there, but that's more on Gary's line of expertise than mine uh, uh, when talking about uh, the, the Satanism and stuff like that. And I know a lot of they don't even, a lot of them don't do it anymore. I know when we was up north, uh, it was very prominent that we had a lot of Satanism there, and uh, it was practiced in the woods around the area where they did their sacrifices. And uh, it's just that uh, when they started looking for humans, that was uh, <laughs> that's when the law got involved. <laughs> that started having to break up some of these things. But anyway. After sacrificing, another another sign is the like I said, the kissing of the images and the bowing down to them. Uh, you know, it, it is ridiculous. People kissing on pictures, people kissing on statues, people kissing on all kind of stuff. You know, uh, and I, I'm gonna be honest with you, folks. You see a lot of this even in uh, the realm of uh, of uh, some uh, religious church groups. Kisses on crosses. You know, I'm not going to even bother. You probably know what I'm, who I'm talking about there. Uh, I, I don't want to. I don't want to say something from the pulpit because we are recording. But uh, I mean, going around kissing on crosses and stuff like that. You got to watch that stuff. I mean, you got cult and 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 things like this, imaging, uh, worshiping images and stuff can creep into churches. Okay, and then look at this one acting off of their own understanding. Or third, number one key thing. When they have to start doing things by their own end and by their own understanding, they're not getting it from God. It's like when God turns people over to a reprobate mind, we've talked about that here in the scripture in our text or in our in our book uh, of Hosea. Uh, we understand that the Bible says that they were uh, uh, making idols according to their own understanding. What looked good, if it looked religious, if it sounded religious. If they went with it, and folks, that that uh, gives an explanation of a lot of uh, so-called religions today. People has dreamed up things and dreamed up ideas. Okay, I'm gonna go back to what I said the other night uh, on Sunday uh, morning, Sunday night. Back it by the scripture, base it off of what the Bible says, not off of what other people tell you. You know, I, I don't care if someone has a big name in the religion uh, realm or in church re uh, uh, region. Hey, listen, if they say if they say do this or do that, and it's not Bible, stay away from it. It's not right. Okay, doing their going off their own understanding. The Bible has given us the only true worship we need, folks. It involves the only Savior, and that's why we need to stick with it. All right, now. I just want you to uh, make a note on something. Uh, what happens to those styles of worship? I told you sometimes they go um, and they're just back and forth. This is what God said in verse number three. He said they're like the morning cloud. You know, not necessarily the clouds in the sky. Those things come and go all the time. But that morning cloud, it's like the, it's like the fog it's in the mornings. And as soon as the sun gets hot, it burns off and goes away. Unless you're in a low depression somewhere, I'm telling you folks, when we was up north, uh, we were in a low depression on the, right on the sea. Uh, the fog would move in and would stay there for an entire week. There would be weeks in that we would never even see the sun. We would have to drive about five or six miles away from where we live just to see the sunshine. It was, it was depressing. You know, I told him one time, I said, is this part of London? <laughs> I mean, I heard the London fog. <laughs> I said, is this part of London? Man, I mean, it, it was depressing every, every day, every morning, every night, nothing but fog. And it was so thick that it kept everything soaking wet. You know, it's terrible when you get out of the shower and you open up the cupboard and take out a towel and it's wet because of the dampness and the moisture and everything. And then you've got to try to dry off with a wet towel. I mean, it, it wasn't fun, you know? But, hey, when the sun came out and finally got it burned off, there would be weeks go by with no fog. It would be beautiful every day. God says that some of this is just like those clouds. They come and then they go away. He said not only that, like clouds, he said it's like the uh, early dew that passes away. You know, as soon as it heats up, it goes away. It's like the chaff that are driven uh, uh, with the whirlwind out of the floor. Now, we think of whirlwind, we're thinking about something out here in the sky, 
No. They had a windmill that they would blow whenever they were uh, separating the wheat and, the, and what they called the, uh, the chaff. They would throw it up in the air and the, the windmill that they had blowing would blow off the chaffs, the part that they didn't need, and the wheat fell to the ground, then they would gather it up. Uh, he said, it's just like that, and, you know, you throw it up, it's gone. You know, you stir it up a little bit, you stir up a, a, a doctrine of the day, and it'll just kind of vanish away. And he said, and then it's also like the smoke that comes out of the chimney. You know there's evidence of something, but after a while it just goes away. I go by these big power companies, and I see over there, uh, going down 26 out of Asheville, heading down toward Hendersonville, and man, I tell you, that big old bulls of smoke coming out, and it's like, right, where's it going? It seems like it just disappeared. Now, we know it's still there. We just don't see it. You know, it, it, go, it turns into the vapor, into the uh, air, and the, the, the sky kind of overtakes it. We don't see it, but it's still there. But we know the evidence of it later on. But uh, God's saying that all this stuff is just like that. It comes, it goes, it's there for a while, and then it disappears. You know, I don't know about you, but I want to I stick with what's real. I want to stick with what's been around. That's Jesus Christ and the Bible. Okay, uh, this thing that this uh, this thing that people says is just too traditional. Talking about the church, it's been around for a long, long time. Let's just keep it. It's proven itself to be right. Okay, but still, yeah, understand that God is not done with Israel. Just because Ephraim, the movement's dead. Ephraim's gone. Uh, Israel's still there. God gives them gives them another chance. Look down at verse number. Five. I mean, we'll see in verse number four, we understand what four said. It says, I am the Lord thy God from a, a land of Egypt. Thou shalt know no God but me, for there is no salvation besides me. He says, I did know thee in the wilderness and in the land of the great drought. According to their pastor, he says, so were they filled. They were filled, They were, uh, and their heart was exalted, therefore, have they forgotten me? Now, just remember something right quick, folks. He's talking about a place of drought. And he talks about a pasture. Talking about they were filled. And now don't think that where they were, that, that, that God at one time blessed the land and it had the grass growing and there was plenty of food stuff. God gave it to them. He said, don't forget. I, I'm the one that supplied this. But he said, they have forgotten me. He says, therefore, I will be unto them as a lion, as a leopard. By the way, will I observe them. I will meet them as a bear that is bereaved of her well and will rend the uh, coal of their heart and there will I devour <coughs> them like a lion. The wilderness beast shall tear them. Let's just read on down to verse 14. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in thee is thine help. I will be thy king. Where is any other, or you know, where is any other that may save thee in all thy cities, and thy judgment of whom thou sayest, Give me a king and princes? He did give them a king in verse eleven. It says, I gave thee a king in my anger, and took him away in my wrath. You know, he's talking about. Saul, okay? The iniquity of Ephraim is uh, bound up. His sin is hid, okay? God said, I've taken him. He's dead. I'm going to take all that away. The sorrows of a travailing woman shall come upon him. He is an unwise son, for he should not stay long in the place of the breaking forth of children. I will ransom them from the power of the grave, I will redeem them from the, from death. O death, I will be thy plague. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from my eyes. All right. Now, like I said, God's still not willing to give up on them. And God says, I've been your God. I brought you out of Egypt. And I'm not going to give up on you just yet. Uh, but I will judge you. I will bring judgment on you. And we see that he brings judgment upon them, number one, as a lion. We mentioned the lion in previous studies. Uh, here he's bringing it out as in this form of judgment. 
Uh, he's going he's gonna to be a, a, as the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he is going to roar with judgment. He's going to roar with judgment. Secondly, he is God as a leopard, which is watching uh, 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 at all times. He's, he's paying attention to what's being done. Listen, this world's not going to get by with what they're doing. Nobody's going to get by with what they're doing. God's keeping track. God's keeping an eye out. God's watching everybody and everything. And, uh, and I believe God watches our nations. I believe God watches out over our nations and, uh, and, and people of our nations. But I believe God says, you know what? I'm, I'm keeping track of everything. I know who's doing what. And don't worry about it. I've always said, man, if I was God, I would do this. I would do that. I'd, I'd have judgment passed on people that probably didn't deserve it. But God says, you know, I'm not that way. I'll do it my own way. I'm going to roar. I'm going to keep an eye on them. And then I'm going to be like a bear. I'm going to put the fear in their hearts. <laughs> I'm going to put the fear in their hearts. That's what he's talking about. He said, when I meet them as a bear, that the, uh, the raven uh, of her webs, you know, you take somebody that's been whipped or someone that's been injured, they're going to lick their wounds, uh, you know. And, man, you can go up to them. They're scared to death, you know. God's saying, that's what's going to happen because he says, I'm going to, I will, I will, he says, and will rend the coal of their hearts. He said, I'm just going to bring them out. <laughs> I'm going to put the fear in them. And they're going to look and say, wow, uh, hello, watch out. He said, and there will be, the, he said, and there will I devour them like a lion, and the beast shall, uh, uh, shall tear them. So God says, judgment's coming. I will take care of this. I will take care of the situation. God's going to take care of sin, folks. He's going to take care of everything that bothers us. You know, we just need to understand that he, 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 it's coming. And he's basically telling Israel, I'm going to take care of Ephraim's sin. It's going to be hidden. I think back to what was a major sin, if I can use those words right now, uh, to describe some things of past that basically now has become hidden. Uh, I remember, I remember when uh, alcohol was such a, a, a major sin in people's lives that people had the bootleg to get it. <laughs> Nowadays, you can just drive down to the local grocery store. It's like that sin's been hidden. It's there, but it's been hidden. People has accepted it. So it's just part of life now along with a lot of other things that goes on in this world, where, whereas we used to look at it and say, mm, you know, I'm talking about grannies used to, you know, man, I tell you, they used to harp on certain things and, and stuff, and now it's no big deal, you know. I, I don't know, I don't understand it. it. It's like it's been hidden, okay? And then he comes up in verse number nine, and I take the first part of this, we didn't talk about the last part. Oh, Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself. He said, Israel, you're at, you're, at, uh, 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 you're at guilt here for destroying yourself with your sin. You brought this upon yourself. This is what's taking place because of what you did. So, so basically what he's saying is because of all this, God is, the, is our only help. There's no other way we can, there's no way Israel can get out of this but other than go to God. God's the one that's going to help them now. Um, God is our only choice of a real king. Now, as I've explained down in the other verses, he gave him a king out of his wrath, but then he had to take that king away. He, he, he repented of the fact that he gave him Saul. Saul was not a good king, but he gave him what they asked for. They said, we want a king like everybody else. Okay, you can get one. And then he had to take him back because he wasn't right. And uh, so therefore, we have to understand God is the only king. I like what that verse of scripture said down here and I'm trying to find it right off the top of my head maybe y'all remember, uh, remember seeing it, okay, it's verse 10 sorry no, it's not just give me a minute here folks I'm still trying to find it <laughs> might have been earlier, he's talking about kings wait a minute, that, that, that song we sang a while ago, that's what in my head, the song that we just got through singing about kings and kings will crown him king. You know, in other words, uh, 
There is only one God. There's only one, and there will only be one king. They'll come to a point where people, everybody realize that there is no other king. He is the only choice of the king. All these other ones are not a choice anymore. God is our only hope from the power of the grave and death. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 says, Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? And that's basically what verse 14 is saying uh, in a different form, in a different way. So make note here also that if we destroy ourselves, we can't help ourselves. If you destroy yourself, you can't help yourself. Remember that. Okay? There goes another red light. Amos or something to be praying. First responders, I guess. Just be praying, whatever that is. Uh, but anyway, if we destroy ourselves, we can't help ourselves. It's going to take God. It's going to take God to help us out. God is the answer to our sin. God is the answer to all our problems. And yes, we've done wrong. Yes, we have sinned. But yes, God is our help. Okay? And that's basically what this part is saying. Now, in closing, let me say this. Does one not get ever get tired? And I'm this just off, you know, just something God put in my heart when I was finishing up. Does people not, does, do we not just get tired of, of the battles that we go through? You know, um, do we not get tired of fighting the same sin over and over and over in our lives? Are we not getting tired of trying to live up to a certain standard in this world that we're living in? I don't know about you, but I, I kind of get tired of it. Uh, what's it going to take for us to, to quit putting on and start doing what's right and just turn to God for the help that we need and let God take care of us? Uh, through the Bible, church and Christian friends and pastors, we do have our help that we need. And those, those, those are placed there for the purpose of hell. But I'm going to be honest with you, until we get on our knees and turn to God, we're going to continue wrestling and fighting over these same things over and over and over. Why choose to do it alone? Why not just give in? Have we not learned anything from Israel's mistakes? And Ephraim, Aaron, dead. So will the church and the Christians if we don't give in to God. And I'm just here to tell you folks, it is prophecy. Because you, these, these prophets, these minor prophets are given prophecy as much as they're just telling you about a story about Israel. And the prophecy is, the prophecy is if we don't do better than Israel, we're going to end up losing some things along the way. Let us turn to God. Let us pray. Father, my prayer is tonight, God, that you just have your own way in our hearts as we search our own lives to do better. Help us, Father God, that we understand by the mistakes of others that we don't need to go those routes, that we need to turn and go in the right way, and that's to follow you. I pray, Father God, as we are about to end up this study, God, that you just open our hearts to thy will so that we can do what's right. Lord, we'll be careful to give you praise and honor and glory. These things we do ask in thy name. All right, God bless you. Thank you for coming out tonight.